What up, YouTube? Tiger here. First, I want to apologize about the quality. iPhone, iPhone's quality is not as good as my Canyon, but my computer is slow. Honestly, I need a new one. It's just, there's something wrong with it, basically. So, I had to get a new one. I'm not sure where that's going to happen. Yeah, I do what I can with it. That's all there is to it. Uh, yeah. Anyways, story time. Today, I want to talk about um, the worst earthquake I've ever been in. This was um, the 2011 March 11th earthquake. Yeah, so I was in that. When we first moved to Japan, we went to Yokohama. Yokohama is like an hour away from Tokyo. And I was I was working in the day as an English teacher and slash art teacher for kids privately. And then at night I'd go to Japanese school. Yukiko, she was a nurse at night so which was kind of hard but that was the life anyways like a year and a half later she got pregnant with Emily and we moved to Kanagawa Kanagawa is a lot closer to Tokyo and her work so it was just convenient because she was pregnant at the time because she wanted to keep working I was like okay I got a new job in, like in Shibuya teaching English like, like a clown you know what it is do 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 you know that's how it is it's like the McDonald's clown so yeah so one day we were, I was talking to her and her mom because her mom li lived with us. Her mom lived with us even now. She, her mom still lives with us. Anyways, like kind of off and on. So I was talking to them about um, moving down to Kumamoto because that's where all Yukiko's family is. And I didn't want Emily to be all lonely growing up and stuff like that and be the only kid because it's not that fun being the only kid. And... Uh, Kiko's mom was like, "No, nah, we should stay here. We're making more money. We're doing well," which I, which I agreed to some, you know, to some extent. And Kiko was kind of on the fence with it, so it was an ongoing debate. So this is the weekend, probably a set. That was like a Friday, okay, when it happened. Anyways, we were going to the bookstore because I love books and I wanted to read to Emily, you know, and get her all hyped up about books and stuff, you know. So we took Emily, the baby. Uh, Ikiko's mom, and we, all of us, we all went to this bookstore, like, it's like four stations for, from where we lived, and the bookstore is on the fourth floor, okay, and again, the conversation came about, about moving, like, it was really odd, actually, so I brought it back up, I was like, you know, here's some good points, because, like, for example, when Ikiko was pregnant, okay, she was on the train coming home from work, right, and some salary man who was you know, half awake, or I don't know what happened. Basically, he sat next to her. No big deal. But then he elbowed her in the stomach, right? So, she, of course, she panicked, freaked out. And she went and grabbed him and screamed at him. And, you know, told the train with your worker and stuff. And she's like, if I have miscarriage, it's your fault. Give me your number, your card, and all this stuff. And he, he was just trying to walk off like nothing happened. So, that's something you'll have to deal with if you're in Tokyo. These, this is their attitude, honestly. That's just one in, for instance. There is many, many more. Like every other day, we could go come home. You know, when she's working, still pregnant, and her work was really awesome. They're like, if you don't feel good, just don't come in. We understand. We get it. And they're super accommodating. But dealing with people just in general on the train. Like every other day, she'd just be standing there, back pain, you know, because she's pregnant. And there's, there's reserved seatings for pregnant, elderly, handicapped, and people just wouldn't move, you know? They're supposed to stand up and let you have the seat, and she'd come back in pain because people didn't give her the seat. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, this is Tokyo people. This is, this is who they are, you know? My first real, for instance, of who they were it was one homeless dude spread eagle on the on the ground looks like he's dead nobody cares just walks over him that's tokyo people okay so i think to myself if i was ever hurt no one's gonna help you here and that's tokyo mentality and, and i think that's a really big deal okay anyways so we're, we're going up the escalator i'm talking to him again about moving and literally five minutes after i began talking to him about moving the earthquake hit. Okay, so we're now on the fourth floor and the earthquake's going bookstore. The shelves are moving so much. I honestly think 
you know, they might fall over and crush people and stuff. The store workers don't know really what to do. One guy just started screaming, I wouldn't sit down. And, you know, which makes no sense, right? If you're between these shelves and you sit down and all of a sudden the shelf crushes you, game over, right? So I was like, I was like, no, 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 you guys, don't listen to him. We are going downstairs away from bookshelves or things that can fall on us, okay? You know, it was, so we, we actually did have to sit for about 30 seconds because the shaking was so violent, you couldn't even walk, can't walk, because the earth was shaking so much. After it, it got a little less, we um, went downstairs. I carried the stroller, Emily, gra or yeah, Kiko grabbed Emily, and we, we made our way downstairs. Other people who saw us leaving, they just followed. They didn't listen to the guy either. And it was like, everyone's like, you know, F this. And they started going, going downstairs and stuff like that. Uh, so, finally we made outside. But, unfortunately, earlier that day, it was, it was cold. Cause, but it wasn't, you know, that cold. The time we got back outside, it was nighttime around 8 o'clock. So, it was really cold. I mean, really cold. My first thought is, okay, survival. Because train has stopped. Every time it is an earthquake, they, they automatically stop the trains for one day and they go over all the tracks because there might be cracks or breaks in the tracks. So if you're driving the train, you'll just cause a train wreck, right? So they have to stop the tra trains. So trains have stopped. I was like, we can take the bus or taxi. Buses and taxis had stopped for some reason. I don't know. I think what had happened is the power went out to the, the refill station for gas, so taxis could not run and buses could not run. There was like this huge, huge line for taxis. So taxis would come like one every half hour, right? And at this moment, Emily is four months old, okay? And we're, we're like right outside of Tokyo. So people were not so much different than people in Tokyo. And people were about our age, some were older, you know, 80, but they've lived their life, right? And we're a young couple with a four-month baby, and they wouldn't let us cut to go home faster, even though the, the temperature was dropping dramatically. We're talking freezing temperature. I spent the first four hours, kind of like survival mode, running to any convenience store to get food. Because first one I went to, everything sold out. Second one, sold out. Made to the third one, got some food. Went to the fourth one, got some food, like that. So it, that's how bad it was. There was no... It, there was power in certain parts. Cell phone wise, all cell phones were dead, I think, besides maybe Docomo. Docomo was the only cell phone company working. We were AU, and AU's. Oh, AU is not that good. It's garbage, okay? SoftBank went down too. So cell phones overall for us were not working. We can't call anyone because we had um, Yukiko's, Yukiko's brother or cousin, and he has a, he has a car. We could have called him. But cell phones don't work. Plus, people won't let you borrow cell phones because they're not nice. You know. So it was pretty bad. I mean, finally, after, after you know, me taking my coat off, even though it's, like, cold enough, if, if it rained at that moment, it would have been snowing. Like, literally. I put my coat around Emily for extra, you know, warmth and stuff like that. You know, even though I'm freezing. And we just stood in line hoping for a taxi. We were in line for hours. And we finally, finally got a taxi and we made it home. So for, that was a completely dramatic experience, you know, beyond disbelief. The timing was impeccable. So when we got back home, I was like, do you guys still want to live here? Of course, the goes, mom's like, yeah, because jobs. And no, 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 no. I was just like, then after she said that, another earthquake. I was like, I was like, okay. I was like, Kika, what do you think? She's like, I'm not sure. She does make a good point. Then another earthquake. And they were like, let's sleep on it. Let's go to bed. It's been dramatic. Um, everyone's freezing to death. Let's get warm. Let's just, let's just, you know, let's just try to move on with our lives. Maybe it'll, you know, everything will be better. Okay. So that night, like five, ten more earthquakes occurred. Throughout that week, hundred more earthquakes occurred. Every day, every minute, you know, you're you're trying to forget about what happened, but every other hour, another earthquake, earthquake, earthquake. So it's very difficult to forget. Then on the news, one of the reactors broke. So Japan is trying to fix this, and at first they put like a, a hundred like meter you know perimeter around this thing, 
So there's people living around it, you know, like older people, farmers, whatever, growing agriculture and stuff like that. They were living around it because, so, I, apparently the head guy knew how bad it really was, but they were kind of downplaying it towards, like, the official government people. So the official government people had no clue, but the head guy of this particular reactor was lying to his teeth, and the 100, 100 meter perimeter is fine, you know, and stuff like that. So... Currently to this day, everyone within that perimeter died, okay? So, later they actually extended to a thousand meter perimeter and stuff, but even like them, they all died too. Then all the workers that were working near it, trying to, you know, like figure out how much radiation is leaking, figure out how to fix it, they all died. So every single person around that area is dead. Uh... And, and this thing was dumping 300s of gallons, like, just so much toxic waste every single day for two months into the ocean, okay? And Japan is like, oh, we got this, we got this. America is like, no, 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 we got technology, let us help, we can help you. And Japan's like, no, 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 we got this. Even even other countries, China was like, I can, hey, I can help you, here's some, here's some technology. And they're like, no, 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 we got, it's like too much pride, we got this. And it's like, no, you, you guys don't got it. Even to this day, I mean, yeah, it's not it's not leaking anymore, but even to this day, it's still, like, big question mark if they got it or not. And that was, like, when Emily's four months old. Now Emily's six. So J Japan, I got way too much pride sometimes, you know, especially during some, such instance. And, like, the only reason the reactor broke is because they were, they were <laughs> legally bound to reinforce them. They were supposed to. Japan is a, is the second country on this planet that has the most nuclear power. The first one being France. So, but Japan, they have water reactors, and they're all around the island. So they're supposed to be extra reinforced just in case of earthquakes or tsunamis. So, so the earthquake was terrible. Our earthquakes was horrible. Next, there was uh, the reactor... So we, we were worried about if our water or food was poisoning and would kill us, because it did kill a lot of people. Then from there, there was a tsunami that was about 23 feet high that hit the top of Tokyo area and literally killed a whole entire town. The, the tsunami warning was so bad, it reached Hawaii and it reached Seattle, where I'm from. That's how bad it was, this earthquake and everything. So, after a week or two of tons of, you know, news that's not good and earthquakes, finally Yukiko's like, we should go. Because I was just like, <laughs> Emily's just born. And this could happen again. Who knows what's going to go on. You have a house that's... You know, in Kumoto, we'll be next to your family. It should be fine if we go there. Even if we go there for a year, six months, two months, and then come back if we have to. So that's when we moved down to Kumamoto. And we were down there for like two years. No, like three years or more, something like that. So we were down there for quite a while. We didn't come back to Tokyo at all. Like, I miss Yokama, I miss Tokyo, but still, like, when I think about that area, that's what exactly what I think about. That was like my last memory there. So I don't really feel the need to go back there anytime soon. Uh, anyways, this next clip, I'm going to show you basically the reality. Like, what exactly happened. I mean, and I want to add small little information. So like, for two weeks, every day after this earthquake and that tsunami, uh, that town, they got wiped out. There was 83,000 people missing, okay, went missing. Like, every single day, thousands and thousands of dead bodies washed up on the shore, these, the east side shores of Japan, every single day. Can you imagine going swimming all of a sudden, these dead bodies just floating? That's exactly what was happening. And on the very edge where it first hit um, was a elementary school. So the first people to be affected by this tsunami slash earthquake were kids in the elementary school they all died and there were so many people that like have all their family in this town they live in this town and they go work in Tokyo because it was very 
conveniently close to Tokyo, right? So they might be salary men, you know, doing their jobs. And they get a phone call like, everyone in your family is gone. They all, they're all got affected by this earthquake. They're all gone. Your grandma, grandpa, your brother, sister, their kids, your kids, your wife, everyone you ever loved, every known, is gone. So it was really, really traumatic. Then there's one other story I want to say. Then I'm going to show you the, the actual news from you know the footage and all that stuff. This last story is about a father who was at work in Tokyo that day. You know, he heard about the news and, and he was trying to call his daughter. Finally, he got his daughter and she picked up. And he's like, "Oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay?" She's like, "Daddy, we're stuck underneath the house." The house is on top of us. And this is like a 14-year-old girl and a 10-year-old girl, okay? So he said, uh, she's like, my sister, she's talking, so she's alive. I'm alive, we're okay, but daddy, come come get us, basically. And he's at work. And I'm sure he's like, you know, leaving work at the moment, calling the cops, doing whatever he can to get there, telling him to go find his kids. But... The hundreds and hundreds of houses were flipped over, turned, wreckage everywhere. Um, yeah, very difficult to find, right? So, anyways, they stayed on the phone for about about hour and a half until the phone finally died. So, within that first half hour, the fourteen year old's like, "I don't, I don't think my sister's alive anymore. She, she's not breathing. She stopped talking. You know." And dad, I'm sure dad's try like, you know, just keep talking to her, you know, probably crying, like, you know, and then eventually it sets in, that's, that's, that's the reality, okay? Then finally, she knew she was going, she, you know, so she's just like, dad, I just want to say something. The phone's dying. It, I, you know, I love you and thank you for taking me to Disneyland last year. You were, you were the best daddy. Um, bye. And that was like the end and I couldn't imagine that at all you know so of course for me like I'm not at that time I'm not staying there I'm sorry you know so that was very dramatic so here's like the news, news footage from that point in time 8.9 magnitude. Now we know that's a big number. It was the fifth largest earthquake in history. But you can only really understand the enormity when you see these pictures. An earthquake so strong it literally shifted the Earth's axis by about 25 centimeters. It all started at the epicenter near Sendai, 230 miles northeast of Tokyo. Shock waves that gave birth to a massive tsunami that started 35 minutes later, Saigai, the Japanese word for disaster. That tsunami reached 23 feet high in some places, nearly twice the height of me standing on Chris's shoulders, for example. And that wall of water is primarily the cause of a death toll that is in the hundreds, but is certain to rise, with 88,000 people in Japan still unaccounted for. The tsunami is also what triggered so many fears in the U.S. today, as the entire West Coast and Hawaii went on alert. But tsunami alerts and warnings were not foolproof in Japan. Japan. The people there had little time to prepare, and even worse, few places to run. It has SOS helicopters. Please land, please land here. Today, Japan woke up to widespread devastation. It is hard to believe it's been just 24 hours since the most massive earthquake in recorded Japanese history. It began as a sunny Friday, much like many others. But at 2.46 in the afternoon, without warning, the earthquake struck. This is the diet session recorded earlier, right when the earthquake hit Tokyo. Uh, at first, the, the, the people that I work with here in Tokyo, it was normal for them. Um, and shortly after that, it, it started to get scary. We are experiencing a earthquake. Oh, Building with terrifying intensity. Everything is falling. Holy shit. As the quake rumbled across the country, school children ran in fear. Shocked supermarket shoppers tried to stay on their feet. Airport travelers dodged falling debris. And a TV crew setting up for an interview was suddenly interrupted. In Sendai, the city closest to the epicenter, books flew from shelves. Debris from buildings crashed to the ground as pedestrians ran for cover. 
Oh, God. 189 miles away in Tokyo, confusion and then panic. Kind of scary. Oh, this building's swaying across over here. Oh, scary moment. Below ground, an American working in Japan captures this dramatic video in the subway. This was somebody taking you by two hands and just shaking you constantly for a good three, four minutes and just wasn't stopping. I was amazed how long this thing was going. It just did not want to stop. All right, I'm going to go under the desk. The quake lasts five agonizing minutes. When the earthquake hit at its strongest point, it was so significant that I, I couldn't stand up in my room. That's how much the building was moving at the height of the main quake that hit. And leaves Japan's capital city incapacitated. Trains stop. Power is cut to four million buildings. Phones are out. Flights trying to land in Tokyo are diverted to U.S. military bases elsewhere in Japan. Buildings in Tokyo swayed back and forth for half an hour. As powerful aftershocks rock the island nation, news anchors wear helmets on television. But the disaster has only just begun. The quake unleashes three massive tsunami waves that hurtle toward the coast of Japan at speeds of up to 500 miles per hour. In Sendai City, a tsunami reached as far as 10 kilometers inland. For the people in the northern city of Sendai, still dazed from the quake, there is too little time to react. A large part of the city has been struck, engulfed by this tsunami. Huge boats are torn from their moorings and tossed into overpasses. Houses are crushed like kindling by the awesome power of the waves. And everything is smashed together into a deadly wall of debris consumes everything in its path. As the wave streaks along the flat countryside, the CCTV cameras record the slow motion swallowing of an entire airport. A bullet train filled with passengers and tourists traveling along the coast disappears, so far without a trace. We are watching this incredible torrent of debris. In the ocean, a huge whirlpool forms off the coast, a result of the ocean floor essentially cracking open, the water acting like it would as if a bathtub is draining, potentially sucking everything down to the ocean floor. Miyagi police report that a boat with 81 people on board is missing. Please evacuate and take precautions. Japan is the only country in the world with an early detection system for earthquakes. It worked well by all reports, sending warnings across the country and allowing some factories time to shut down. Still, an oil refinery explodes. And that fire in an oil refinery completely under control, a large inferno. Perhaps most ominously, this nuclear plant on the coast of Fukushima is in a state of emergency when its backup generator fails, compromising its ability to keep its radioactive core cool. The reactor is only 170 miles northeast of Tokyo. Even as Japan mobilizes a global realization that the giant wave is traveling east across the Pacific. So we don't know the, the height of the waves if and when they hit these islands. That is absolutely unbelievable. Here it comes again. And other countries begin to this brace for shoes. impact. This is straight, coming straight over the wall onto the main road. In the hours before, Honolulu police prepare for the worst, evacuating tens of thousands of people near the beach. In Hawaii, a series of waves seven feet tall hits just after 8 a.m. Eastern, but fortunately does little damage. Crescent City, California, hit by a tsunami back in 1964, had a hard day today as well. An eight-foot wave came in, destroying the city docks and piers, doing millions of dollars in damage. Similar scenes in Santa Cruz, but nothing like the scenes of devastation in Japan. Late today came word that the missing ferry boat and its 81 passengers had been found. Rescuers have arrived via helicopter. But for Japan, the long journey back has only just begun. This woman who comes from Yokohama says she cannot reach her family and she's worried about them. Overnight, tens of thousands of people slept on the street in 37-degree weather or huddled in shelters, contending with over 100 frightening aftershocks. Aftershocks have been consistent. I have to easily say there's been over 30 throughout the day. This morning, rescuers fan across the country as survivors emerge and fresh scenes of devastation and tragic human loss. 
A bridge snapped in half. People perched atop a shattered apartment building. Amazingly, with its strict building codes, Japan came through with much less damage than other countries would have suffered. And thank God for the, uh, the way they build buildings here because I may not be talking to you. A cautionary tale for those other nations in the deadly ring of fire. We're joined now by Akiko Fujita, our ABC News reporter in Tokyo. And now, Akiko, things have had some time. People have had some ability to get settled there through the day. What are you seeing? Well, we're still seeing plenty of gridlock out here. Uh, you can see all the cars just jammed. We're seeing this on many roads as people try to head out towards the disaster zone. Traffic not so bad away from it. Uh, in Tokyo, we are starting to slowly get back to normal. Some train lines back up and running. We see the street lights uh, working, power running, and, uh, and water running as well. So things slowly starting to get back to normal out here, but obviously uh, the hardest hit area up north, uh, not the case. And the fear of the unknown there must be tremendous. What are you hearing? What are people concerned about? Well, the biggest concern really is just the death toll. When you look at those images, uh, massive waves just uh, coming, uh, crashing on shore yesterday, immediately after that earthquake hit, and you see those homes being washed away. You can imagine just what kind of damage that caused. People are getting out there today, and uh, they are just uh, concerned about what they could see. Death toll sure to rise uh, in, the, in the days and weeks ahead. What do you know about the recovery effort and the ability to get supplies to the hardest hit areas? Well, the Japanese government has put, you know, all hands on deck. Uh, just thousands of thousands of people affected out there. They are trying to get people out there as soon as possible, but they also have to be mindful of their safety. Uh, a lot of uh, structures out there are very unstable. Uh, some of these homes to see if there are any survivors, but uh, the conditions making that difficult as well. All right, Akiko, thank you so much from the reporting there in Tokyo.